the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford University, creating a more equal society for women and men through data-driven research and public education. When I first came to Stanford in 1972, it was a big deal. And Stanford made a big fuss about the fact that the business school had hired their first woman, the law school had hired their first woman, the engineering school had hired their first woman, three for one. And so very shortly thereafter, I was visited by these three students. And they thought we should start a Center for Research on Women, and I should start it. I explained to them that I was a lowly assistant professor, and assistant professors don't start centers at Stanford. I was very alone at the business school. And so the more I thought about their idea, the more I thought, oh, this sounds like a really good thing. If I tell you that many of the male faculty eyed us with suspicion, uh, that probably won't come as a surprise. A professor from the history department took my hand and said, you're doing a great job, Marilyn. You're not letting the lesbies take over. And I thought about that statement for so long. What I wished I had said was, yeah, and if I do an even better job, nobody will ever be able to say something like that again. Every quarter we had a lecture series. And the people who used to come were so varied. Some students came, faculty, some faculty came, but mostly they were secretaries who would come at noon with their lunch and soak up all of the new stuff that was happening because it was just a revolution about women. Suddenly, women were important, women's issues were important, and these secretaries, you, you could see they grew three feet in height while they were at the lecture because suddenly all the things that they were interested in and concerned about were important. My goodness, here at Stanford there were lectures on these subjects. Over the 35 years since the Institute was first founded, there has been a profound and uh, complex evolution of uh, the kinds of questions that are being studied. Each of the directors that came in brought her field and her knowledge to bear. So when Diane Middlebrook was director, we had a marvelous poetry conference. When Deborah Rohde became the director, we began having more legal issues, particularly involving low-income women. When I became director, I was interested in helping to show where gender matters in areas where it isn't obvious. And we were able, through a program called Difficult Dialogues, to bring people together who hadn't really thought about the gendered issues in aging and to get them to begin to discuss the, the problems that are arising for women more than men. Representing a deep then Londa came. Londa asked a question that I think was just not on the table in the 1970s. The first question was about women in science. The next question was about gender structure in science. The next question was about gender bias in science. Our new project, Gendered Innovations in Science, tries to move away from identifying bias to a more positive project of using gender as a resource to say, okay, if we really use all of the tools of gender analysis that have been developed over the past 25 years, what new knowledge can we create? We support gender research at many levels. One of the most exciting is the faculty fellowship program. This brings faculty from each of our eight schools together for weekly meetings where we exchange research, we collaborate, we network, we push things to the next level. Back in 2000, I was in my last year of my PhD program, and I had applied for and received a graduate dissertation fellowship from the Institute. And when I came back and you know, walked in the door, you could sort of instantly tell that this was now a, a souped up operation, if you will. One of the great things about the Institute is that we can take the knowledge created at universities, translate, and get it out to the public. 
Our idea is that women need to get their voices out there. Gender research needs to get out there, and what we are doing is teaching faculty how to write for a larger public. Uh, currently, uh, men write significantly more op-ed pieces than, than women do, which means that women are not having the opportunity to really participate in important public debates. The program itself, I think, has been very effective, and the evidence of that is the number of op-ed pieces that have actually appeared as published documents. Many times people wonder whether sex inequality is still something that uh, one should be concerned about, whether there's a need for an institute such as the Clayman Institute. The short answer is that gender remains pervasively significant. One might call it a glass ceiling, you might call it a gender hierarchy, you might call it simply unequal outcomes. But to imagine that gender simply doesn't matter seems to really blind oneself to uh, the reality. It's coming out next month in the American Sociological Review. I teach an undergraduate a sociology of gender class. I think their first reaction is to come in and think that there's nothing left to do. To the extent that women are not achieving things, it's, some, it's because there's something wrong with women, not something wrong with systems. And so the real challenge with young people is to really get them to see the patterns that have happened over time, and to see beyond themselves, if you will. What's often helpful in these instances is to show them examples from other countries, say Sweden, that has very different policies than we have in the United States. All of a sudden, this it strikes them as just simply unfair and that something should be done. So it's really just a matter of convincing them there's still a problem and the passion um, flows from there. One of the things that was true when I was director is that I spent a lot of time raising a very small amount of money. You know, we didn't quite do bake sales, but you know, I would have lunch with someone and if they wrote us a check for $500, I was very happy. And so I think Michelle Clayman is just a fabulous example of a woman who is, is so successful and so giving. Now a lot of people when they meet me are surprised that I'm not dead uh, because usually when things are named it's because the person is no longer with us. And for me it's been very interesting because I'm now enormously proud of this place. When people make a gift to us or even endowment level gift, they can be sure that no matter how small or large their gift is, it will have mileage. Since I've come here, I've become very clear, investing in the core knowledge has a very long tail and will eventually transform the way my daughter enters her university years. And that's why I invest my time and my person in this institute.